the Art of Leadership Network. Now, if while that equation is going on, our survival brain also perceives us as helpless or powerless or lacking control in the situation, it's going to turn on even higher levels of arousal, and that moves us into the zone of trauma. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Trauma has been front and center in a lot of conversations as of late. You know, from trauma therapy to trauma bonding to the trauma brain's response to life and relationships. Hey friends, thanks so much for joining me this week for episode 285, where today... We're talking all about training your body and brain to thrive during stress and how to recover from trauma. Well, joining us today is Dr. Elizabeth Stanley, author of the acclaimed book, Widen the Window. By day, she's a political scientist who specializes in international security. But today, you're going to hear about her very personal experience moving through trauma into wholeness. But hey, before we head into the conversation with Liz, if you're enjoying the podcast, share it, send a text to a friend, to a family member, and invite them to listen as well. And then rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening, especially on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. Here's why. When you rate, when you review, and when you share win today, the listenership here grows and we get to help even more people design their roadmap to wholeness from the inside out in their spirit, in their soul, and in their body. It's why I'm here and I trust it's why you're here as well. So thanks for doing that. Right now, let's get to my conversation with Dr. Elizabeth Stanley. You're listening to Win Today on the Art of Leadership Network. Enjoy, guys. Liz, what a joy to welcome you to Win Today. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me and having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, I am too. As we spoke before I hit record, this message about transformation and the subject matter of trauma and stress is so so personal to me. So I'm just very, very grateful for your time today. And uh, I tell you what, here's where I'd love to start. Trauma has been front and center in a lot of conversations from trauma therapy to trauma bonding to even the trauma brain's response to life and relationships. So I'd love to start by asking you, Liz, to, to lay a foundation of what trauma is specifically and then how it manifests in our bodies. Let's clear the deck and start afresh. Okay, that sounds great. So trauma is actually on a continuum with stress. And in our general understanding, that often isn't pretty clear. So I want to start by first defining stress and then explain how trauma is kind of a continuation of Please. it. Stress happens whenever we have um, a stressor, an event, either inside of us, like racing thoughts or a flashback or, mm -hmm. or recovering after surgery or something outside of us, um, like uh, traffic or COVID or uh, you know, other challenges in communities. We have this stressor, our survival brain, some of the oldest parts of our brain, perceives the, the stressor as threatening or challenging. And if both of those things are there, the stressor and this perception of threat, we will turn on stress arousal, which is nothing more than all of the ways that our mind and body are mobilizing focus and energy to be able to cope with that challenge. And for many of us, we don't then recover from that. So we stay in a chronically activated, a chronic stress state which over time has kind of undermining effects on our resilience, which we may talk about later. But that is, I present it as an equation because in some ways it's a neurobiological done deal. If we have a stressor and our survival brain perceived it as threatening and challenging, we will have stress. Can't not have that happen. Now, if while that equation is going on, our survival brain also perceives us as helpless or powerless or lacking control in the situation, it's going to turn on even higher levels of arousal, and that moves us into the zone of trauma. And so the really important components of trauma are the fact that we have perceived ourselves to be helpless, powerless, and lacking control. And this is where it often gets people caught up because our thinking brains, the parts that make conscious decision-making, um, they might not feel helpless or powerless or lacking control. So like, wait a minute, I'm not traumatized. But it isn't up to the thinking brain whether the trauma happens. It's up to these evolutionarily older parts of our brain, the survival brain. 
And that uh, perception of helplessness, powerlessness, it's happening at an unconscious level. It often happens if the current situation, the current threat or challenge contains cues that are similar to prior traumatic events in our life, because our survival brain makes all of its choices based on its assessment in the moment, and it compares it to these implicit memories, this bank of all the prior moments that it was assessing, you know, stress and challenge. And so if there's something that happened earlier in our life, often from childhood, and there's any similarity that the survival brain could generalize and expect that the current thing is like that prior thing, it can, it can move us into the zone of trauma. And it's one of the reasons I think why people will often say, but I wasn't traumatized, even as their body is going through trauma reactions. And that can create a lot of hmm, confusion for us uh, as we're trying to cope with, well, why, why did I respond that way? Why did my body and mind do this? Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense. It's often because of these older perceptions that the survival brain is enacting. Do you think that's why some people, when we're engaged in relationships or just working out our issues of life, say, oh, that wasn't trauma or whatever? Is it because trauma is disregarded in some conversations just because of the lack of awareness and understanding about how trauma manifests in our lives? I think that's part of it. I think part of it, too, is we have collectively created narratives or norms that that stress is kind of a badge of honor. I mean, in, in our country, especially, but I think in much of the modern world, being stressed is considered somehow a sign that we're important or we're, we're special, we're busy, yes. we're, we're successful. And so people brag about how little sleep they got or how overscheduled they are or how many things they have on deadline and how long they've taken since they take a vacation, all of those things that we kind of consider valuable. Stress gets romanticized. But trauma, all the way back since before PTSD even existed as a medical diagnosis, trauma has often been... Um, disowned and kind of treated like people are someone who's considered traumatized, that, that, that means that they're broken or that they're malingering, that they're weak. Um, and nobody wants damaged. Nobody wants to be those things. So even if they actually are traumatized, many people don't want to acknowledge that they've been traumatized because of these societal narratives of what it means to be traumatized. Does that make sense? Uh, no, it really does. And it leads me to this quick question then. Maybe it's not a quick question, but I'd love for you to poke this box. Big T traumas versus little T traumas. What's the difference? Yeah, I think that the big T traumas, um, from a neurobiological standpoint, we have so much stress arousal all in one moment that it overwhelms our threshold, the window of tolerance that, that I talk about in my book. And big T traumas, things like combat or rape or a natural disaster or um, a terrorist attack, a mass shooting in the school. Collectively, we are willing to say, yes, that's traumatic. And we're not necessarily going to um, blame someone or treat them as broken or damaged because we collectively agree that was a traumatic thing. So most people don't have a problem admitting that they experienced trauma in an event like that because that's somehow an approved trauma. But interestingly, from a neurobiological standpoint, the little t traumas, things like being caught feeling caught and trapped in a job that we don't like or um, coping with sexism or racism or some other kind of harassment or discrimination at school or in our workplace or being in a family where um, someone is out of control, um, dealing with an addiction or very violent and we don't know how to kind of escape that or, or change it. Those are all traumatic. Those are all instances of trauma too. The survival brain would be feeling helpless, powerless and lacking control. But in, in those kinds of situations, there's much less of a kind of collective agreement that that is capital T trauma. And so we are much more likely to judge people as somehow weak or unable to get it together, you know, if they're having symptoms after something like that. Even though from a neurobiological perspective, it's the exact same reaction. 
It's a situation where we've turned on stress arousal and the survival brain is perceiving us as helpless, powerless, and lacking control. I want to put a pin in this because I think one of the things I think about is if someone is in a dysfunctional relationship, that occurrence, that experience is normalized in their neurobiology, yes, and all of absolutely. a sudden they can't distinguish healthy from dysfunctional, and they wonder, oh, I don't actually even know what healthy is. So we'll, we'll put a pin in that and come back to this, but it makes me wonder regarding stress and trauma, where we started this conversation, if we miss the fact that stress and trauma are on a continuum, does this help explain why so many people just experience partial healing? I think that's a big part of it. Um, I think a lot of people, I think that's a part of it. I think also a part of it is as a society, we still tend to normalize thinking brain techniques, things that help our thinking brains feel better, mm -hmm. but that may not actually be addressing some of the root imbalances in our bodies, in our, our nervous systems and in our survival brains. So we haven't, so that the healing ends up being incomplete because we've only addressed a piece of what is actually going to bring us back to our baseline. So I think both of those things are going on together. I understand that. And that's so helpful. In fact, Let's just stay here. Uh, give us a primer, Liz, if you would, on thinking brain and the survival brain. Uh, where is each housed? What are the key functions of each? And I'll even just say this as a, as a primer here. Um, you know, in my own research, I found that the limbic system is a million times more powerful than the executive function of the prefrontal cortex. So I think that's part of the conversation, but I'll let you take it from there and teach us. Absolutely. Um, so I use the terms thinking brain and survival brain because for me, they kind of get at what these two functions are. I don't want to say that they are definitely distinct places in the brain because they have overlapping circuitry in a sure. big way. Sure. So when I use these terms, I'm using them to kind of differentiate by function. And it's very similar to how Daniel Kahneman, um, the economist who wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, He's talking about thinking fast and thinking slow. It's the same thing. He's just using those terms to get at these two functions. So his thinking fast, I'm talking about as the survival brain and his thinking slow, I'm talking about as thinking brain functions. But um, thinking brain functions are, as you put it, mostly housed up in the prefrontal cortex. They are the evolutionarily newest parts of our brain. Um, and these functions control executive functioning, our ability to pay attention, hold distractions at bay, um, make plans and follow through on them, um, have information that might be conflicting, and then to deconflict that information, conscious decision making, um, explicit memory, which is when we kind of consciously and intentionally think of something that we need to remember and remember that fact or the story of our life. And willpower is actually also a thinking brain function. Um, so all of these things um, belong to the thinking brain functions. All of them work best when we are at a moderate stress arousal. It's one of the reasons I think why our society has such a caffeine addiction, because a cup of coffee can kind of sharpen these functions into that moderate arousal. Yes. So uh, all of those functions work really well at moderate arousal. All of those functions get degraded when we experience chronic stress without recovery, or when we get into the high arousal zones of trauma. And we know that these functions get degraded when we start seeing us making biased decisions, we start falling into us versus them thinking, that's when we get really tribal. Um, that's, I think, part of why we're seeing so much tribalism in this country right now, in fact. So when we see people get in, uh, in very anxious thoughts, um, worry and racing thoughts or rumination where you're constantly running over the same thought over and over and over again. It's also when we see ourselves getting really distracted or unable to concentrate. Those are all signs that we are in degraded thinking brain functions. And not surprisingly, it's also when our willpower gets really bad. So we have a harder time with imp stopping impulses interrupting negative emotions, um, avoiding those temptations and cravings. This is when we break our diet or we start engaging in infidelity. Um, all of that happens when thinking brain functions get degraded. Okay, so th that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece are the survival brain functions. I use the term survival brain because these are 
evolutionarily older, and these functions exist for our survival. That's why they were wired. Um, and unlike the thinking brain, we hear the thinking brain's running commentary of thoughts in our head. So many people identify with their thinking brain. They're listening to it all day long. It's narrating you know, what's going on in life. The survival brain isn't talking to us in our brain. We don't hear it. We can only see what's happening in our survival brain via the effects in our body. So we might watch our physical sensations and our emotions. Those are our cues about what's happening in our survival brain. And our survival brain is responsible for neuroception, that unconscious threat appraisal process of the stress equation that I was talking about before. And if it, if it appraises something as threatening and challenging, it turns stress on. Um, and to support that, it has this implicit, implicit memory bank. So it's all the prior moments of neuroception in our life, which is the reason why you and I, Chris, might experience a stressor and I might get stressed and you might not, or vice versa, because you have one implicit memory bank and I have a different one. Um, it's why we're going to have very different reactions. We each have our own individualized accumulation of implicit memory. And then the survival brain also controls all the survival functions of fight or flight, and even the, you know, the older, um, the response of trauma of freeze. It controls all the organs turning on and off and the, the hormones turning on and off to help us survive. It just does all of that automatically. And then when the survival brain perceives us to be safe, that's when it turns on all of the rest and recovery functions. So um, that's when we eat, that's when we sleep. Um, and uh, an implication of that is if our survival brain isn't perceiving safety, it's not going to be turning recovery on. And that's part of what leads us to be in this kind of chronically stressed state. So these functions, all of them are automatic, they're pre-conscious, they're fast, and they exist that way so that they can keep us safe. Um, the thing is, and this gets back to the, the incomplete healing comment that you asked about before, Chris, many of us identify with our thinking brain and we choose things that help our thinking brains feel calmer. But many of those things, actually, the survival brain perceives as threatening. So while our thinking brain might be calmer, our survival brain is actually turning more stress on and it creates a bit of a paradox. During the pandemic, for example, um, and the pandemic existed, it has all the characteristics of stressors that would lead us to turn on a lot of arousal. It was unpredictable. It was uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. It was threatening to our physical survival. And it was new. It was novel. All those things make us have more stress. So for many of us, our thinking brains are like, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And so our thinking brains naturally gravitate to grab more information. Everybody went and started like looking at statistics and reading their social media cues and their, their feeds. And as, as we did that and gathered information, our survival brain took that as threatening and turned on more anxiety. And then we gather more information and the survival brain turns on more anxiety and it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you've said that so much. That was a much. long answer. Oh no, I loved it. In <laughs> fact, folks, listen, I want you to, I want you to hit pause. I actually want you to rewind and listen to this again, because this, <laughs> this I think is a meta narrative for even how we approach transformation um, in our baseline understanding of what's happening on the interior. Now, I want to just poke a couple boxes from the information you just shared, the first of which is willpower. Now, one of the arguments I assert often with the listeners here on Win Today is that, sure, self-help, sure, sure, willpower is helpful. It's just really limited. And what I heard you say is because it's in the thinking brain, if we have these implicit memories that are being driven from survival brain, they're going to override our, I know that I want to do this, but I am just, I can't, right? So the first thing I heard you say is when it comes time to changing our lives, we can't rely on willpower. You can't will your way through it. You can't. And if you try, you're only going to end up feeling guilty and ashamed because willpower will be degraded. Your survival brain is going to be driving the show. You're going to end up choosing a behavior that you didn't want to be choosing, whether it's procrastination or drinking alcohol or self-harming or acting out against somebody else, whatever it is, you're going to do something that then you're going to then feel guilty and ashamed about. That actually just adds more to the stress load and decreases your willpower even further. And it sets up this awful, vicious cycle where people end up hating themselves for years. 
And you can't will your way out of it. You can't. And worse, we normalize that experience so much so we wear it like a coat. And now healing and transformation is indistinguishable from this shame, pain, fear, shame, control cycle that we have lived in for so long, right? Yes. Okay. So the second piece I want to connect with you, Liz, is this. Because what I heard you say regarding the implicit memory bank is that, therefore, early childhood, and we're going to get to adverse childhood experiences here in a little bit in the conversation, but early painful memories that are truly now subconscious. Like we might not actually remember the day-to-day details of the moment, but our physiology does. So early painful memories that are now subconscious frame up the lens through which we see ourselves, others, and circumstances, thus overriding the thinking brain, thus rendering us guilty and ashamed. So I'm just, I'm fired up right now because I think we are on the precipice through your book, Widen the Window. In fact, folks, TV timeout, go to the show notes at wintoday.tv right now. I'm going to put a link to Liz's book, Widen the Window. It changed my life and it'll change yours too. Go get a copy or 10 right now, wintoday.tv. But Liz, I am so fired up because I think it's in understanding this cycle. In fact, let's just paint this picture and, and go down this rabbit hole. So I shared with you some of my my story and what led me to sitting in a Barnes and Noble two and a half years ago with tears streaming down my face reading your book and going, where has this book been my whole life? And here you are today. And um, as it was for me using my own life circumstance, and I don't need to replay this because the listeners know, um, we all experience pain, loss, disappointment, crisis at some points in life. Therein is a, a is a stressor, a, a traumatic moment, whatever that might be. I'd like to propose, therefore, that the neurobiological reflex is to insulate ourselves because who likes to feel pain? But in doing so, after a while, we end up isolating ourselves so much so that not only are we, yeah, sure, keeping ourselves from bad people and bad circumstances, and we'll just use relationships as an example here, but in the same motion, we're keeping ourselves from good people, life-giving circumstances. And in so doing, we're atrophying the the wind in the sail that keeps us going forward in life. Thus, our, our reflexive behavior and thinking is fear, shame, control, shame, blame, guilt, as you said, and we go right back to feeling more pain and we're trapped in this cycle. So I know I just said a lot, but does all of that seem to add up and help us explain why so many of us are desperate for change in our lives. And we are doing the right things, but getting the wrong result. And we don't know why. I absolutely think that many people are doing the right thing. They do want things to be different, but they don't understand why they aren't. Um, I was this way myself. Um, in many ways, my own mind and body were exhibit A of what I end up writing about. and. I coped the way I had been socialized to cope in my family of origin and then in the military, which was where I was working at the time. But even in all of the high achieving environments I had been in before, you don't have to be military or or a first responder to cope this way. We have habituated in our culture that it's somehow a, a good, a valuable thing to be able to keep pressing and going through adversity. And yes, in a crisis situation, in an emergency, in something that is like a really big deal right now, we have to be able to to keep going. But that's actually not the way our wiring was designed to be used. Our wiring was designed to be able to manage that crisis and then have some time, if you think about our, our ancestors, hold away in a cave for a couple days at a time for things to recover and settle again. We don't live that way. And so we're habitually kind of compartmentalizing and pushing things under and powering through and our bodies end up bearing the burden of that. And then it comes out sideways, either in uncontrolled emotional outbursts that we don't know where that came from and why we can't stop it, or it comes out in broken relationships, or it comes out as it was in my case through somatization, where we begin to produce a lot of physical symptoms, which is where all of that arousal went in terms of creating chronic inflammation and then a lot of different disease states. 
And we don't connect those outcomes with the way we were living and the way that we were constantly going. And our society values the way we were constantly going. And we don't co collectively connect it to these outcomes. So we don't realize how much the way we were socialized to move through the world is so imbalanced. And then we're coping with whatever happened, whether it's the relationship failure or an, an ethical lapse or a physical illness or an addiction or something. And then we take all of those outcomes very personally and say, something must be wrong with me without acknowledging this is just the effect of having lived that way for so long but we don't connect those dots. And then we, as you put it, end up with this shame and blame and guilt and, and it, it can stop us in our tracks. And so part of the reason I wrote this book, it was the book I wish it existed when I was in those very dark days myself, is to help us begin to recognize this is a mind and body doing what minds and bodies do. It's not personal to us. It's saying nothing about our own willpower or our own goodness. It's, it's, it's the way that our minds and bodies work when they get stressed or traumatized and they haven't had recovery. And learning that and understanding the science of it was hugely liberating for me because it made me realize this isn't because I'm bad or broken or damaged. This is this is what a mind and body does when it has these kinds of conditions. And there are choice points and leverage points that I could do and take advantage of that would unwind this and wind it in a different way. And that learning that we have leverage for improving this, for building our resilience, for transforming, that was huge. And in my book, there are two major leverage points. Is it okay for me to go there? Chris? I would love for you. To, yes, most definitely. Please take us there. <laughs> the, the two major leverage points are where we're directing our attention, whether we're doing that consciously or unconsciously. Our attention is always being pulled somewhere. And our attention, wherever it's being pulled, whether it's conscious or unconscious, it creates ripple effects through our survival brain and our nervous system and our body. So where we're directing our attention, that's the first leverage point. And the second leverage point is our habits. Because everything about our neurobiology is the result of repeated experiences. That's how the wiring process works. And habits, habits drive most of our repeated experiences. So if we work with the leverage of where we're directing our attention and which habits we're investing in and which habits we're letting atrophy, that, that's where we can begin to see change. It's not instantaneous. And anyone who tells you there's a silver bullet is just wrong. That's not how the neurobiology works. But we can, we can gain a lot of, we can get empowered because the, these leverage points do with time show us that shifts are possible. And that then is kind of self-reinforcing in a virtuous cycle way. You said most of us have been socialized to cope with stress and trauma by stuffing it. Now, to the extent you're comfortable sharing, I'd love for you to tell us how that played out for you as an example. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit. I share some of my own story in the book because uh, I want my readers to know that I have skin in the game on this. Um, uh, I come from quite a long history of, of chronic stress and trauma. As I said, I'm kind of exhibit A of what I'm writing about. Um, I experienced childhood adversity, um, including childhood sexual abuse um, by someone that I knew, not in my immediate family. Um, and then sexual violence as a a teenager. Um, I served in the military and experienced uh, stressful military training. I was abroad uh, in Korea and then in Germany. I did two deployments in the Balkans um, in, with uh, the UN and with NATO. I was part of the force that went into Bosnia right after the Dayton Peace Treaty was signed and uh, had a near-death experience. I stopped breathing and needed to be resuscitated um, in Bosnia. Um, and I was, uh, after being paddled three days later, was back in my unit doing my job again, talking about sucking it up and driving on, like just no recovery time. Um, and through all of that, through all of those very intense experiences, um, I, you know, came from a military family. I'm the ninth generation of my family to serve. So I was an army brat and was socialized to, you know, we, we lived in a quite military culture and was abroad a lot of that time. Um, and we were sort of compartmentalized and keep going was kind of the way we were, we were uh, 
raised. And then that got really taken up when I was in the military too. The army calls it, suck it up and drive on. And, and that's really what it was. Um, and through all of that, my body bore the burden of that denial. Um, I had chronic inflammation that led to chronic respiratory diseases. I had suffered from insomnia. I had migraines. Um, and then when I left active duty, I was diagnosed with depression and PTSD um, and was starting uh, the healing process. Um, but I was so out of touch with my body and so out of touch with my choices that I, it took a while to kind of unwind some of the choices that I had made that were not the right choice. And if I'd been able to listen to my intuition a little bit better, part of cutting yourself off from your emotions is also cutting yourself off from your intuition. And so I, I in some ways, had wandered down a path that felt really not connected to me. And part of healing was beginning to reconnect to me. But um, the thing that finally got my, my big attention was I had Lyme disease, but didn't know it. I'd had it for over 10 years at that point. Um, and I lost my eyesight. The, the Lyme attacked my optic nerves. Um, and for a while, the doctors thought I had MS, uh, but I had clear brain, brain scans. So they didn't know what was going on because um, that's often a, a sign of, of MS. But um, losing my eyesight my first year on the tenure track at Georgetown was a, a great way to get my attention because I was not quite sure how to be a professor without being able to see. And it it raised, it was like a frying pan upside my head. And it, it raised to, to the fore, I needed to find a new way of being in the world. Um, and that started a 20-year process of my own healing and then some clinical training. I did intensive uh, mindfulness retreats here in the U.S. I also spent some time in a monastery in Berna. Um, and then I designed MFIT, the resilience training program, uh, and partnered with others. And all of that kind of came to a culmination with this book. Um, but it started from not being able to function in the world, um, being without eyesight and coping with a lot of physical and emotional pain. Um, I was in a marriage that really needed to fall apart, uh, and it did eventually. There was just a lot going on that um, I had been sucking it up and driving my way through without really paying attention to what was going on. Um, and in some ways, it was kind of a metaphor when I lost my eyesight. I didn't want to see what my life was at that point. Thank you for sharing that. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Um, the Lyme has been cleared. It, we didn't figure out it was Lyme actually until mm. much later, uh, many years later, but the Lyme is clear. I'm physically healthy. Um, I'm very happy and uh, I'm in a, a much, much better place. Um, I know it looking back on the others from the other side, that point where I was in my life and it felt like the way things are need to fall apart, but I just can't imagine how painful it's going to be to have it fall apart. So I was stuck for a couple of years, which is traumatic in its own way, where it's like I knew something needed to change, but I didn't know what needed to change. If I could go back now and talk to myself at that phase, uh, the thing that I wish I could say to myself is there is an immense amount of energy that gets locked up in fearing the change. And as soon as you let the change start, <laughs> that energy gets released and can be used to a much better effect. Um, hmm. And so now looking back, I'm like, why did it take me so long? <laughs> because the first signs of how bad it was, was when I was, you know, leaving active duty um, in 96. If I had started the process of change in 96, instead of sitting on it and letting the symptoms build for another eight years until my eyesight lost, um, that's, it's not a regret. It's just a, it was a, a life lesson that I wish I could have had someone tell me. Um, I don't know if I would have listened to myself back then, but um, I think we often hold off on making changes that some part of us know we need to make out of, it's just fear, but it's, it, it traps an immense amount of energy um, and getting the shift underway releases that and can really fuel the transformation in a very beneficial way. Is it, is it fair to say then for all of us, and I know this is going to sound like a generalization in some way, so forgive me for it and folks give me grace in this, but um, is it fair to assert that perhaps 
it's not as much the situations that we're in, but rather our fear about the situations that we're in that impede our ability to take the very step forward that we need to begin the process of transformation. Yes, I think the fear is really driving a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps just to hit the bullseye for people then, because I know everyone has experiences and stories that are, are both common with others, but also unique to themselves. Can we just hit this bullseye? When we suck it up, what happens in our physiology? Your life is proof of it. So is mine. When we suck it up, we are, we're doing a couple things. From the stress and trauma perspective, we are blocking our survival brain from being able to access safety, and it needs to feel safe for it to begin to start those automatic recovery processes it knows how to do. So the sucking it up is a form of suppression that actually narrows our capacity to manage stress even more. It gets it, it narrows it further. So it undermines our resilience further. And there's a lot of research in the last, I'd say, 10 years that has really been looking carefully at the physiological and emotional and cognitive effects of emotion suppression. So just the, the piece of, of suppressing challenging emotions. But you can generalize from that to also talk about the, the stress suppression too. And it feeds negative thoughts. It makes depression and anxiety worse. It builds inflammation in our body. It's linked with high blood pressure. It's linked with decreases in immune functioning. It's linked with weight gain. It's linked with heart disease. It's linked with um, a variety of different um, coping behaviors that I call stress reaction cycle habits, alcoholism, and other addictive behaviors, stress eating, sedentary behavior, all, all these things it's also linked very badly with, um, not very badly, but very strongly, it's linked with chronic pain and with suicidality. So it's, it's linked with all of these different, very uncomfortable mind and body outcomes. Um, and we continue suppressing because we've been socialized that that's what, you know, good people do, but it's actually making it worse. Um, and so many of these organizations that have suck it up and drive on as one of their defining ways of being as an organization, they have this for a good reason. It isn't like they're trying to be malicious on purpose. I mean, the organizations that train this, you think about first responders or the military or the, the healthcare profession, they train this because they want their people to be able to still function in a firefight or when they're you know sending somebody into a burning house to rescue people or they're in the ER and someone has just coded and they have to try and revive that person. You don't want someone to just freeze up and not be able to focus or do anything then. But if you train someone to do that in these extreme circumstances and you've trained them to do this all the time, it becomes a habit. It's not a problem for the extreme circumstance. You need it for the extreme circumstance. It's a problem when it's habitual. And these organizations don't do a good job of training opposite behavior for other habits, you know? Um, so people like I, I couldn't not do that. That was all I knew how to do. I spent decades learning how to suck it up and drive on. And even in times when I wasn't in a stressful situation, I'm still sucking it up and driving on because that's the only habit I had ever been taught. Mm. It took me a while to learn other habits to counteract that. And ultimately, that's what we want is the flexibility that we can access that capacity during an extreme event, but that we don't have to live that way all the time because it's the living that way all the time that's the problem. I'm so fascinated right now because what I hear you saying in a way is across long term life experiences is that sucking it up is fueled by shame, which says armor up, just plow through, but then in so doing, it blocks vulnerability that asks help. Yes. Yes, it does. Hmm. Yes, it does. And the thing is, we are wired as social animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, humans have to be. Human infants can't survive on their own. And the reason why we have all of these different mechanisms of social wiring is to ensure that we can cooperate and function together. I mean, humans were not the apex predators on their own. They only became the apex predator as a group. 
And human infants need parents or other people to care for them until they can be independent. I mean, we don't reach adulthood. We're the longest species. Our species is the last to reach adulthood of all the species. We need support from other humans. And our social wiring gives us all kinds of advantages. But interestingly, our social wiring when we're stressed gives us all kinds of disadvantages. And so we're living right now with most people in this chronically stressed state. And so our social wiring is giving many of us disadvantages. We're not able to take advantages, take advantage of the advantages that it gives us. Um, and to tie that back to what you were saying a moment ago, when we engage and suck it up and drive on, our thinking brains are telling us we're being self-reliant and we value self-reliance. But when we do that, we are blocking all of the resources that were wired into us that come from being part of a group and supporting each other in a group. Um, and that, in some ways, is one of the most tragic aspects of humans during stress. We, we cut ourselves off from one of the big advantages that our species really mm -hmm. have, has, but we're not taking advantage of Liz, I want to I want to go into the direction of talking about adverse childhood experiences. We tipped our hat to it earlier in the conversation, but right now I'd love for you to talk about what adverse childhood experiences are, and then really how they manifest throughout our lives in an addictive way. Hmm. Yes. So, in the late '90s, there was the beginning of a recognition that what happened to neurobiology in our childhood before we finished wiring our nervous system and our immune system and our brain, that that might have lifelong effects. And the first study was done with Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the you know, health insurance um, organizations in the San Diego area. Um, and they had you know, hundreds, tens of thousands of people participate. And they asked them about their experiences with childhood adversity. Uh, they have a, there was a questionnaire they used to ask about, you know, did they experience um, violence in their family of origin? Did they experience uh, sexual uh, assault or contact? Did they experience um, uh, emotional uh, or physical abuse? Did they experience um, a family member who was incarcerated or addicted or dealing with mental illness, uh, especially a parent with any of those conditions? Um, and the, the first study was really surprising in that it showed that most people experienced at least one adverse childhood event, one ACE, but um, about a quarter of them experienced more than four. And then they matched um, the data from the, the questionnaire to people's health outcomes as adults, looking at their physical health outcomes and their mental health outcomes as adults. And what that first study, which has now been replicated and extended in lots of different ways in the last 20 years, what these, um, what these different studies show is that for those people who've experienced ACEs in childhood, especially if they experienced four or more ACEs, it is profoundly linked to um, a lot of different uh, physical and mental health issues as adults. And this yes. isn't surprising when you think about the fact that our neurobiology is the result of repeated experiences. And in childhood, you're experiencing repeated chronic stress in these situations. You're often experiencing chronic trauma because as a child, you don't have a lot of control. You don't have a lot of resources. So your brain moves into this helpless, powerless, and lacking control space. And you're experiencing this state of chronic stress arousal during the time that your brain and body are still being wired. So it's having this downstream effect. It, it, it affects the wiring that then leads to all kinds of a trajectory of undermined resilience later. And in one book, with two, two chapters in the book, but one especially, I look at all of the different research across the ways it affects the brain's wiring, the nervous system, the immune system, the dopamine system, which is our reward center, um, our, our hormones, all these different really detrimental effects. And so for those of us who experienced childhood adversity, it's like it affects the structure 
of our brain and body that we take into stressful events as an adult. Yet most of us have no idea that this was going on and therefore having an effect. Um, and for me, it was really, really powerful to understand that. You know, I had an ACE score of six um, by the time I got to college. And then there were several traumatic events that happened during college and shortly thereafter. No one had asked me about that. And I had never connected those dots until I was researching this book. But then it was like, oh, that's why this happens. That's why this happens. And that was so helpful to understand. It helped me not take it personally uh, in quite the same way. Which then empowered you to take steps toward healing, steps towards yes. transformation, because you had yes. facts that could then validate your experiences to realize, oh, now I understand and can pursue um, wholeness in a way that is productive and, and even reverse some of the effects of what happened in the past. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And for those of us who have ACEs, had those experiences, once we have recovery, there's sort of a silver lining in it by having had such high arousal levels. Once we have full recovery, that actually gives our mind and body a wider window of tolerance to stress than someone who hasn't had those experiences. So it's like the positive upside is if we do get the recovery afterwards, we can be more resilient than someone who hasn't had those experiences. Resilience isn't about being pampered. It's about experiencing something stressful and then getting recovery. So especially for those of us with childhood adversity, there's the potential to build an extreme amount of resilience if we've done the work to have that recovery happen. Oh, that's that's really, really helpful. You know, if listeners today want to find out if they have an ACE score, what that is in, in assistance of their journey to wholeness, where can they find that out? So you could Google adverse childhood experience survey, and that will pop up probably the original 10 question survey. Um, but in the research that's been done in the 20 years since that first uh, uh, study in San Diego in 1997, there have been, there's been additional research looking at other things that do have the same effects as ACEs as things that are on that list. So I have a more holistic list of what counts as an ace in my book in chapter seven. Great. Well, we'll link again, folks, to the book, Widen the Window, in the show notes, but also I'll Google um, one of those resources and put that in the show notes. So if you are looking for that, just go to wintoday.tv. I'd love, Liz, if you could, because again, this is personal to you. It manifested in Lyme for you, MS for me. Talk about how aces impair our immune system. And this is, this yes. is quite literally my story. Yes. Well, it's interesting because it isn't really until the last probably 10 years that scientists and doctors have begun to acknowledge how much chronic inflammation is underlying a wide range of different physical and mental health issues. Um, and chronic inflammation is uh, the result of an epigenetic change. Um, epigenetics is the science of how repeated experiences affect our gene expression. So if we're having the repeated experience of chronic stress, and that can come from having chronic little t traumas, like mm -hmm. we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. it can even happen from something as mundane as chronic sleep deprivation. And interestingly, in the science literature, chronic sleep deprivation happens when we have two weeks or longer of just getting six hours a night. That's where many people live all the time. So I'm saying that to make the point, we can end up with this epigenetic change towards chronic inflammation without having trauma ha history or a lot of stress history. If we're just not getting enough sleep, we can have that change happen. It's really important for listeners to know that because sleep is single, the single easiest change we could make that could help change our, our, our body's functioning. But when we have this epigenetic change that it, it, it affects the gene expression that puts our, um, it puts our immune system on a footing where it gets very, very good, hypersensitive at turning on macrophages that are kind of looking for the bad guys. So turning the inflammation on, but it gets imbalanced because the cytokines to turn the inflammation off are no longer working as well. So we're turning inflammation on, we're not turning it off. Any little thing gets it hyperactive and it turns a lot on and then it never turns it off. And over time, the whole system develops chronic inflammation. 
And it underlies such a wide range of things, chronic pain, allergies, asthma, um, MS and other autoimmune uh, issues, um, depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD, dementia, um, and so a range of different cognitive issues, um, heart disease, uh, diabetes, just, just a wide, wide, wide range of different things that we don't connect back to the chronic inflammation that resulted from chronic arousal. Mm. Could you spend a little more time on the importance of sleep? Because one of the things that I hear is, well, we'll just make up for lost sleep. I know it's been a busy week, but we'll just sleep in on the weekend. But I, I don't think that's possible in my own research. Is there What else should we know about, about sleep? In fact, I'll just quote you from your book. You said possibly, and you just said it here. Uh, so for redundancy, you wrote possibly the single most important choice we make in daily life affecting the width of our window is how much high quality sleep we get on a regular basis. This is no joke. This is absolutely no joke. And as someone who slept for many years in the two to four hours a night range, uh, I did that through much of high school and college and my first years in the army. Um, I know from first exp firsthand experience what a kind of um, <laughs> that punch drunkenness where you haven't had much sleep, the the self um, the self delusion it creates of I'm invincible. It can mm -hmm. we can have this sense of we can function really well, and our thinking brain might be telling us we've had enough sleep. But in all of the research between people's subjective assessments of how well they're doing versus their actual per performance on tests cognitive tests and emotional tests, there's no correlation there. So the less sleep we're getting, the less good a judge we are of how badly degraded um, you know, we are in that situation. It's super clear. We can't make it up on the weekend. There's been a number of studies that have looked at giving people six hours a night all week and then give them two nights on the weekend to get eight hours and check their cognitive and emotional abilities then. doesn't cover. It doesn't make it up. They're still degraded. So sleeping in on the weekend is not enough to fix it. Um, obviously, there's some difference by person, um, but most people, most, most, most people need between seven to nine hours every night for them to be really rested. And I have a chapter that lays out in detail all of the different epigenetic changes that happen um, when we're not getting enough sleep. It has huge effects on our hormone system, on our immune system. Um, there is even research that the UN uh, has put together that shows how much chronic sleep deprivation is carcinogenic. It really is linked very strongly to cancer. So um, it's really important. If there's one thing that you do to help really re-regulate yourself, it's getting enough high quality sleep. I know from firsthand experience though, when we are very dysregulated, um, Getting sleep is often one of the things that goes first. You know, you know, when you're dealing with anxiety or depression or chronic pain, it's hard to fall asleep. Sometimes it's we wake up in the night or we wake up very early and can't go back to sleep. And so it's it's important to really um, be kind to ourselves when that happens and not um, not then think that our lack of sleep is going to make things worse. And that can actually make us more anxious and make it hard to sleep. So. In the book, I lay out some things we can do. My, my big go-tos um, when I have been very activated is making sure that I've had some time um, where I'm getting cardiovascular exercise during yes. the day, Yes. making sure I've had some time outside in daylight during daylight. Um, and on nights when I've been very activated, I will make sure that I take a very hot bath with um, Epsom salts and some lavender in it. And that really helps my system come down. Um, but it's very important also to disengage from our devices. Um, the blue light in our devices actually blocks melatonin and we need the melatonin for our system to, to fall asleep and for the circadian rhythm to work. So being off of our devices at least an hour before we go to bed, um, I still read old school. You know, I go to the library and get hard copy books so that I'm not, I, I do like to read when I go to bed, but I don't want to do it on a device. Um, so, and making sure that we're not going to bed super full. It can be really helpful to um, eat at least three hours before bedtime. And, you know, a lot of people rely on alcohol to help them wind down. 
And the thing about alcohol is, yes, it might get you sleepy and you can fall asleep, but then alcohol almost always wakes you up in the middle of the night as your body's processing the sugar. Really? So, yeah. Um, so it's really good not to do a lot of drinking or eat a lot of sweets at bedtime. Both of those things will likely wake you up in the middle of the night. That's worth the price of admission right there. I mean, the, the conversation around sleep, I think, is just gold. Um, you know, Liz, I am coming upon this research myself, but opposite of post-traumatic stress, I found is post-traumatic growth. And yes. you mentioned neuroception earlier in the conversation. So can you unpack this really hopeful possibility for us? In fact, I'll just tease this and say, I like to propose this relates to your phrase, widen the window. You even want to go there? Yes. Um, as I said a little while ago, um, Chris, when when we've experienced a lot of stress um, and we've narrowed our window from that, if we can support our mind and body to have full recovery, that will widen our window. And that is part of the post-traumatic growth. Someone who's experienced a lot of stress and then they have a full and complete biological recovery. This isn't their mind kind of doing an after action review and it, it's not that at all. This is helping your survival brain to perceive safety so that it turns on all of the different hormonal and other changes in the organs in the body to discharge all of that energy that got mobilized for the stress activation. So it's not, this is not just doing a mental after action review. I, I want to make sure people understand that. And in, in MFIT, I teach people how to direct their attention so that their survival brain can perceive safety and allow that discharging to happen. Mm. When we do that and we have a full recovery, it allows our brain and body to be able to thrive during greater stress arousal levels in the future. So, um, you know, and this, is, this isn't unique to the human species. Um, in the book, I talk about animals that do this too. They, they build their resilience by experiencing an event that takes them out of their comfort zone and then having that complete recovery. What makes humans unique is, you know, the animals can't block the recovery from happening. As soon as they are somewhere physically safe, their body naturally goes through recovery. Humans, because we have thinking brains, we can block the recovery from starting, and that keeps us with our window narrowed. So in some ways, it's a process of teaching us how to get out of our own way um, so that our body will do the recovery it naturally knows how to do. And when we do that, we end up with a wider, a wider window of more resilience. You know, going full circle with this conversation, which has been so rich, Liz, you're a political scientist who teaches about international security and you have a military background. We've touched on these things. And in short, what led you to just even step into this space to begin with? Like I said, you know, you, uh, I think have had experiences with this, but what led you down this road? I said a little while ago, and I, I mean it, I, I do think that, um, and you said it too, before we were on tape, we, those of us who do research and write tend to research and write about what we, we need to know for yeah. ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who is a preeminent, you know, internationally renowned trauma researcher who wrote the, the foreword for my book starts the foreword with every bit of research is me search. And in some ways that's right. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I needed to know all of this. My own system was so unable to function. Um, and everywhere I looked, I wasn't getting the answers I needed. So it, it, this book came out of my own journey of transforming my own life. And, um, in some ways I feel like it was a book I was meant to write because, the book was in some ways a co-creation of all my own experiences in this mind and body kind of partnered with the beyonds that, that helped me to write this thing. And um, I, sometimes my political scientist colleagues uh, are like, why, why do you do this? But when you think about humans during stress, coping with uncertainty and manifesting conflict, that's what international security is all about. I'm just approaching it from the level of the individuals in the groups that are warring or, you know, at, at having challenges together. So my work since this book has moved back out to the kind of collectives of humans. Um, 
And this is where our social wiring becomes really important. You know, when we are stressed, as I said a while ago, we are much more likely to engage in us versus them thinking. We are much more likely to um, end up engaging with others from a conflictual standpoint instead of cooperative one. Uh, it just, it, it feeds. Uh, our collectives get stressed too. Um, so international security needs this understanding of stress and trauma. Um, and I think our individual understanding of stress and trauma can help to um, fuel not just individual transformation, but also collective transformation too. And that's where I'm really hopeful that our understanding of these issues can really help us collectively um, design some new responses. Because if there's been a more stressful time on the planet with more uncertainty than right now, I don't know when that was. I mean, we're facing a planet that's on fire. We collectively need to find some collective responses um, to deal with the, the range of things that are, are facing us in the near future. And so I'm hoping that our understanding and healing as individuals can help us to heal our collective too. Absolutely stunning, guys. Go get a copy of the book right now, Widen the Window. It's in the show notes. Liz, this has been a stunning conversation. Is there anything else that we haven't covered today that you'd like to leave with the listeners? I um, want to just reiterate what I said a while ago because it really is so important. We have capacity to change our own lives. And the two points of leverage we have for changing our resilience is where we're directing our attention and which habits we're investing in. I talk about both in the book, but if you're interested, especially in the how to direct your attention, please go to my website. Um, you can download the first exercise from the MFIT sequence. It's five minutes long. It's an exercise called the contact points to train your attention to a target object that your survival brain will find safe that will help your system start with recovery. Um, and if that's of interest, then you could even do the whole course. I, I created an online version of the MFIT course with Sounds True, um, and it's available on demand, and the links for that are on my website as well. That's perfect. And your website URL is? www.elizabeth-stanley.com. Oh, my word. Liz, thank you. I mean, today was just remarkable, and uh, I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. This was so fun. Head to wintoday.tv slash episode 285. That's wintoday.tv slash episode 285. Right now within the show notes is a link to purchase a copy of Dr. Stanley's book, Wide in the Window, guys. It changed my life. I'm also going to put a link in the show notes on how to determine your ACEs score. So we talked about adverse childhood experiences in the conversation. I think that's a helpful thing to know. So go check that out again, wintoday.tv slash episode 285. Also, hey, I want to tell you about my brand new resource I'd love to put in your hands. It's my new weekly email called Win the Week, which is all about getting under the hood of your heart so that incremental steps toward transformation can be made in your mental and your emotional health and in your spiritual growth. Listen, it's a quick win, quick read, no frills, weekly email designed to be read and applied in less than five minutes. So go to wintoday.tv right now. Sign up for that. It drops every Wednesday in your inbox and it's absolutely free. Well, listen, next week here on the podcast, we're joined by Crispin Mayfield. He's a professional counselor and we're talking all about how to determine your attachment style what a rich conversation it was. Here's a preview. You know, it is, it's thoughts and feelings kind of alternating back and forth in our brains. So it's kind of um, true. Like the answer is yes. Uh-huh. Oh, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. However, what I find to be really helpful, and this relates to thoughts and feelings, is if we can slow down and understand our th our emotions, mm -hmm. then we can go forward from there. We're talking all about attachment styles right here next week on Win Today. Don't miss it. Thanks again for joining me this week. I believe you should be able to live at your best in your relationships, in your mental and emotional health, and in your personal and spiritual growth. Self-help and life hacks help, but they will not turn the key to total life transformation that lasts. And creating a plan for sustainable transformation is what Win Today is all about. That's why I'd like to invite you to join the inner circle of readers on my email list who receive weekly strategies for growth. 
Just go to wintoday.tv right now to sign up. It's absolutely free. Lastly, whether you're a new listener or have been listening to the show for a while, I'd really appreciate your rating and review of Win Today on Spotify and on the Apple Podcast app. Until next week, let's connect on social media and on my YouTube channel, and of course, at wintoday.tv. Thanks again for listening today. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll talk to you again really soon. Bye-bye.